Hi everybody, we will start the webinar shortly. Um, we're just giving a couple of minutes. Um, let the remaining few people join and, and we're, we're, we'll start. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody, um, and um, welcome to today's seminar where we'll be talking about the QNOPS, a uh, qualifying non UK pension scheme for those who don't like the acronym. So, we quickly cover the agenda. Um, so, uh, we'll start by covering, well, we will do an introduction shortly. And then, what is a QNOPS? which I'm sure you're all eager to learn. We will cover the tax treatment and, and the benefits of, of using one. And at the end, we'll cover a few common pitfalls, things that you need to be aware of. And at the end, we will invite question and answers. There's a feature on Zoom to submit your questions and answers. Feel free to submit them as we go on, and we will answer those at, at the end, but do so as we go. and. and we, we can cover those then. So a quick introduction for those who haven't spoken to us before. So my name is Matt Empold, Advisor and Director here at Fiduciary Wealth Management. I've been working in financial services for 20 years, spending the last four years here in Gibraltar after relocating from the UK, although I work in Gibraltar and I, I live across the border in, in Spain. With me is, is Paul Correa, Managing Director and co-founder of Fiduciary Wealth. Paul has extensive years in financial services, coming from a strong private banking background and, and, and wealth management. And then in 2007, he co-founded Fiduciary Wealth Management, partnering with Eastlers 1892, which is the oldest law firm in, in Gibraltar. So aside from my legal roots, um, we are a member of MGI Worldwide, which is a top 20 global network of accountancy and tax advisors. And our service is concentrated, although not exclusively, on servicing clients in four jurisdictions, the UK, Gibraltar, Spain, and Portugal. And our goal is very simple, which is to offer unbiased expert advice to, to deliver solutions and, and outcomes for our clients. So, We'll start the contents of, of the webinar today, which is solely focused on, on the QNOPs. We have run um, webinars on, on tax and, and relocation based on Gibraltar, Spain and Portugal, and we will be doing some more shortly. So if you're interested in that, and I'm sure you are, please visit our YouTube channel, Producing Wealth Management. Those webinars will be added in the next few days. So please like, share, subscribe. And, and enjoy that content, and, and there will be more, more to come. So, what is a QNOPS? So, a QNOPS, to confirm, it stands for Qualifying Non UK Pension Scheme. So, the explanation of, of what it is, is is covered very nicely in the name. So, we start with the, the qualifying. So, a scheme has to be qualifying to, to, to be a QNOPS which means it needs to be regulated in a suitable jurisdiction. Part of that qualifying criteria is that, that no benefits can be paid before normal retirement age, which is 55 generally. 
Um, I think the QNOS is actually an unapproved scheme. And, and what they mean by that is it differs from your normal UK scheme. A normal UK scheme, you get tax relief. You don't form a QNOS. We'll cover the funding for later. But um, as opposed to a UK scheme, there are no limits um, on the investments you can make to a QNOS. There are caveats to that based on your personal circumstances, which again, we will cover a little bit later. So we've got to qualify as a non-UK pension scheme, as it says. It's, it's, um, it's developed and aimed for either those who live outside of the UK or those who are planning to move to the UK. Now, for those planning to, sorry, planning to move out of the UK, for those planning to move out, um, especially important for you because we will talk later about the need to, to plan in advance and, and how that can be more suitable for, for you. And then pension schemes. So it is a, a genuine pension scheme and it needs to be established as a genuine pension scheme. And, and we'll explain a little bit later what we mean by that. Matt, since you are making the introduction, you'd be surprised how many firms are promoting QNAPs on the basis that you can establish it and remain tax resident in the UK. Yeah. Which means that you avoid UK inheritance tax whilst you're living in, uh, and, and, and being a tax resident in the UK. And if you're very close to or, or have already exceeded your lifetime allowance limit, this is a way of continuing to grow your pension assets free of a lifetime allowance charge. Yeah. And that is not how QNAPS was born. Absolutely. I mean, it gives you two specific scenarios where you can establish a QNAPS if you already established tax residency in a third country, or you are planning to do so within 12 months of establishing the scheme. Correct. But, yeah. but it is worrying when you look around at literature, I've seen one on the website this morning, and, and more generally, yeah. and how it's being promoted as a um, uh, UK IHP fudge, which will never work, and, and to, to circumvent the lifetime allowance charge, which yeah. doesn't work either. And the clues in the name, non-UK, isn't it? So um, people can, as Paul, you rightly say, you can establish it as you're planning to relocate, but quite likely you might have to sign a declaration of, of sorts to, to basically say, I'm, I'm definitely going to relocate. Because if anybody thinks, OK, I, I can set this up and then say I change my mind, it's not going to work. And Absolutely. anyone who promotes it in that way, I don't know, avoid, avoid, would probably be the... Would probably be the advice on that one. So uh, that is what a QNOPS is. So, so what are the key features? So I said briefly before, a QNOPS dis differs from your uh, traditional pension. So a traditional pension, we uh, pay into from our lifetime, build up regular savings, maybe by a workplace scheme or, or similar. A QNOPS is, is funded by a lump sum investment. So you may have had assets in an ISA or investments in the UK, if you've now departed or planning to depart, those ISAs are no longer tax efficient for you. You may have sold your UK property or a rental property. So you have a lump sum of investment that you could use to invest in, in the QNOPs. And why would you do that? So firstly, there's no capital gains tax on, on the growth because it's a, a pension scheme. Um, secondly, there's, um, Income withdrawals can be paid at a very efficient tax rate, and I'm Paul, you will cover that later, I believe. Um, and any sum invested is immediately outside of your estate for, for UK inheritance tax purposes, even if you do return at a later date. Now, you might be thinking, well, um, I, I'm, I'm, I've relocated out of the UK, I don't need to worry about UK IHT. Well, again, I think Paul, you will kind of explain why people should be kind of concerned about that. And we talk about the qualifying rules. So, so one of them is, I think we've covered, it is about where you live and where you're planning to leave. We would never, and no one should ever set this up as, as a fudge because it doesn't work. The pension needs to be set up as, as a genuine retirement vehicle and the funding of it needs to be reasonable in line with your wealth, your age, and your future income retirements, sorry, income requirements. 
So what we mean by that, and, and when somebody asks us, okay, how much can you contribute to our, to our QNOPs? That depends on your individual circumstances. And, and really, if you are interested in a QNOPs, the sooner you look at it, the better. Because it needs to be a genuine retirement scheme. So to, to use a practical example, Paul, if you've got someone age 75, they've got net assets of 3 million, and they think, okay, I'm going to put 2 million in a QNOT, I don't need to pay inheritance tax on that. HMRC won't accept that. It's not a legitimate pension scheme. They are just doing that to, to avoid inheritance tax. But you've got someone of a younger age, they want to um, build all the time and provisions. Um, they can invest a, a, a certain amount in the QNOPs and, and build up their retirement um, provisions. I think the important point is that you get caught up by UK um, income tax anti-avoidance provisions. That is the key element. Yes. So if you overfund and you're doing it in order to avoid UK inheritance tax, then there's anti-avoidance provisions which will capture that transaction and deem it to fall within your estate. Yeah. In other words, you've created this QNAPS, you've, you've uh, funded it from your net worth, you think those assets are now outside your estate, but because based on those criteria which Matt mentioned earlier, namely, you know, um, your overall wealth and, and uh, that the contributions are reasonable in light of your wealth and your income requirements. If, uh, if that's exceeded in any way, then when everything is taken into account, it will be, uh, it will fall back into, this, into the UK estate. So I think when you establish a QMAPS, you want to make sure that it's done, that the funding is commensurate with your overall wealth and income requirements, yeah? Absolutely. Sorry, we've emphasized the point three yeah. or four times, but I think it's really, really important. And you can do, you can do that with an actuary or without. Because, you know, with common sense, you can ensure that you remove some of those assets from, from the estate without ever falling foul of UK income tax and anti-avoidance rules. Exactly. And, and so when, when somebody asks us, as a general question, how much can you contribute to a QNOPS, there is no uh, catch-all answer. It, it, it depends on your circumstances, depends on, on, on your age, your income requirements, your overall wealth. So we, we can do a, a, an assessment of that on a one-to-one -one basis. So if, if that's something that you are interested in, um, anybody who says, okay, you can invest this amount as a general term, that's not accurate. It, it needs to be in line with your situation. Um, and it's an incredibly good tool, but it's set up correctly. And the thing is, the point is, and I think you've just touched on that briefly, the older you are, the less that you can put into the humans yeah. because they're taking into account um, lifespan. So you set it up at 74 and they estimate that, you know, your lifespan is going to be another 10 years and, and you're putting a large sum in. That's one of the factors they'll consider in an actuarial report, yeah? Yeah, no, I to think see it's... Whether it's been underfunded or... Yeah, I think it's one of the key factors, actually, Paul, and, and so... Um, a QNOPS is in, incredibly attractive, it's set up in the right way, and, and that's why we say, look, the sooner you look at it, the better, because you can increase the amount of, of funding to, to do that. Um, because it is a pension scheme, you, you do need to um, take income from it, but at age 75 is the limit. So when you reach age 75, then the trustees of the pension scheme will, will say you need to start taking income. That is, uh, is probably self-explanatory in the sense that then it is a pension scheme, it's designed to, to, to provide that income for you. Um, and another question we get is, is what assets can you hold within a, a, a QNOPS? So there are other um, wrappers that are available for expats, so a compliant bond is, is a very common one. So the difference between the QNOPS and, and the compliant bond is, is the compliant bond you are restricted to collective investments that are what they call UCITS compliant. So that's a certain category of investments, whereas a QNOPS 
there's a much wider range of investments you can hold in there, collectives, ETFs are, are, are similar. Um, I did read something actually earlier, Paul, and, and they were saying, okay, you can invest in commercial property and classic cars. And, and whilst I think technically a QNUPS allows that, I have yet to find a trustee who would accept that. And, and right. is, it would be very, very unusual. I think we've tried it on a number of occasions for clients. Yeah. Trying to um, transfer across a property into a QNUPS, for instance. But, but you, 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 come across a few problems because firstly it involves a transaction, a sale and a purchase. Yeah. Because the legal entities you go from a private individual to a pension trust, right? So there's considerable costs to take into consideration. Yeah. And then secondly, it's not always practical to hold it within the trust structure. We've tried it on a number of occasions, it's never been possible. And the other thing is a pension arrangement is supposed to provide a pension income for life. And if you have immovable assets yeah. and they're not being rented out yeah. and there's no other assets within the, the QNAPs, how do you provide that pension income? Exactly. And then so it doesn't tick that box again. It doesn't tick the, the box. A genuine pension. Scheme. There's one point that you mentioned about pension benefits, drawing pension benefits. I think it's important because this webinar is for mainly British nationals moving to Spain, Portugal, or Gibraltar, basically, the Iberian Peninsula. The tax treatment of, of um, or rather the tax treatment, the amount that you can draw down as a pension depends on the jurisdiction. So if you're a tax resident in Spain or Portugal, because Spain and Portugal have a double taxation treaty with Malta, we would have a Maltese QNAPS. Correct. And the Maltese QNAPS allows, is, is fully aligned with the UK pension industry in that it allows flexi drawdown. In other words, it gives you greater flexibility in how you draw your pension benefits. With the caveat that there's annuities to consider and you can't just chop and change yeah. because there's detrimental tax implications. So Spain and Portugal has a, a tax treatment based on the double taxation treaty. Gibraltar, on the other hand, treats it differently. It's just a, um, it is still governed by the old GAD rules, which stands for UK Government Actuarial Department Rules, which specifies based on age and the size of the pension fund, how much you can draw. So Gibraltar has an adopted flexi drawdown. Yeah. So how much you can draw is, is I would say as a general rule of thumb is closer to five. I think and then five, yeah. five is a good guideline, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. But, but Spain and Portugal have that great flexibility. Yeah, absolutely. And you just say they're kind of caveats in, yeah. in the sense of the tax treatment of that. But um, no, it's a, a good point raising that if you are based in, in Portugal and, and Spain, Malta is, is the accepted jurisdiction for QNOPs, um, mainly because they are qualifying, which we covered before, but because of the double taxation agreement and they have with those two countries and, and any income paid from a Maltese QNOPs is, is paid gross and therefore you just have your tax obligations in, in your, your country. So we move on to the next part and, and so what are the key points of, of a QNOPs is Although it can't be set up as an IHD fudge, um, one of the key benefits is because it's a, a legitimate pension scheme, that can be immediately outside of your estate for UK inheritance tax. But Paul, these individuals are not live, living in the UK anymore. Why do they need to worry about UK inheritance tax? Well, that's a very good question, Matt. And, and you're right, why should they worry? And, and the simple reason to that question I'll cover, but, but let me say the good news is that there's, and let me look at the three jurisdictions that we're covering in this webinar. In Spain, and, and in Spain because succession tax is based on the region and the autonomous region, the tax treatment might vary slightly. So for simplification, when we talk about Spain in this context, Let's just think that we're talking about Andalusia, which is southern Spain. So in southern Spain, the good news is that there's no succession tax applied 
to estates for the first 1 million euros of assets. And then if your total assets exceed 1 million, then you pay 1% in succession tax for anything in excess of that figure, which is negligible. Right? That's as close to zero as you're going to get. Like exactly. It is almost zero. Um, and as I said, the, the autonomous regions may vary in the application. Right. So that gives you a good guidance. The good news in Portugal is that there's no um, succession tax between direct descendants and ascendants. So if you pass away, you have no family and children and your parents inherit. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So between direct uh, descendants, there's no succession tax, which is brilliant. Yeah? Right. Covers almost everyone. Yeah. And then in Gibraltar, it's even simpler. There's just no inheritance tax period, Depend, regardless of you know the line of, of descendants, the amount or whatever. Clear, no inheritance tax. The bad news, Matt, and I'm sorry, I'm um, the um, the, bearer. the bearer of bad news, but the bad news is that even though you are a tax resident in a third country. You are you are you remain exposed to UK inheritance tax, and UK inheritance tax is not based on the concept of tax residency. It is based on the concept of domicile of origin, which is a concept which is probably alien to to any living being. But let me explain it in 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 simple terms. Uh, this is something you acquire at birth normally taken from your father. Um, so whilst you can acquire and claim that you have now a new domicile of choice in the country where you become tax resident, uh, because you intend to live there permanently, this is always fraught with difficulty because there's no fixed rules and the burden of proof always falls on you to prove that you have successfully acquired a new domicile of origin, of choice. And HMRC won't give you any, any guidance because they, they, they'd like that you trip over, right? Absolutely. And, and that you pay tax. And it, it, in any event, in our experience dealing with hundreds, if not thousands of, of British nationals, it's not uncommon for a British national to come to Spain, Portugal, or Gibraltar, and then temporarily due to ill health of one of the, of, of the spouse or themselves, they have to return either permanently to the UK or even temporarily for a year. But even one year is enough to trigger domicile. So you lose your domicile of choice and revert back to your domicile of origin. So not straightforward, right? Theoretically, theoretically, if you look at HMRC guidelines, it says that you can avoid UK IHD after five full and complete tax years of non-UK tax residency. But in practice, it's much more complex than that because there's all kinds of ties. Ties which will then determine that you never share your domicile and you're still caught by the UK IHD tax. And things like business interests, social connections, family interests, property ownership, and then there's the all-encompassing clause, which is your intentions. Um, and, and that one is so ambiguous and fluffy and, and, and wide that it can be interpreted in a multitude of ways. Um, so basically, even in significant ties that you may consider to be something that you completely ignore because you can't believe that that's you know, a tie to, to tie you back to the UK. HMRC have been known to rely on the most tenuous of grounds to dismiss claims that an individual has shared his domicile of origin and has a new domicile of choice. So you can't really fall back on that. You can't really um, plan on the basis that you've left the country and you've got a new domicile of choice. Let me give you one example to, to uh, emphasize the point. You all probably heard of, of the late Welsh, Welsh actor Richard Burton. He lived for many years in the US before moving to Switzerland in 1957. 
He lived in Switzerland for 27 years before passing away in 1984. The UK tax authorities made a successful claim on his estate on the grounds that he never actually relinquished his UK domicile, even though he'd severed his ties with the UK for more than 30 years. And the claim was successful. He'd had PAC advice, everything has been done properly, been advised correctly, what to do, what not to do. But uh, the claim from HMRC was successful due to the fact that he purchased a burial plot in Wales. And therefore, he always had emotional ties with the mother country. And he always intended the intentional tie yeah, no. to return to the UK. And, and the basis for the claim was that he was buried in a, in a red suit, in a red dragon, the colours of Wales, and holding Dylan Thomas poems. And that was enough to, to, um, to uh, support the claim in court. So at the time, Richard Burton had an estate of five million pounds, which might not some, sound like an awful amount of money, but it was in those days, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about almost 40 years ago. And of the five million, 2.4 million had to be paid to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs uh, because it was deemed UK domicile. The good thing, the good thing is that if, you, if you're a non-UK tax resident and you plan early, there's incredible opportunities to restructure your assets in a tax efficient way and completely legitimately to either mitigate or eradicate this tax. But like everything else, you know, don't leave it when you're on your deathbed and plan then. Yeah. You know, you have to plan that early. And I think don't cross your fingers and, and hope HMRC are going to ignore you because being a natural cynic, I would say that the, the rules that they set are quite vague. They would never tell someone if or not they are still domiciled. And I would say maybe that's intentional. Um, that hunts you down because they, they want to kill. And the worst part is you're not there to defend yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They hunt you down, and remember that all governments are he heavily indebted. They have to raise revenues. We've had, we've seen in recent weeks, the um, you know we've had I think four chancellors and three prime ministers in four months because you know they, they are desperate to deal with the debt issue and raise revenues. Um, but it's not easy to do so as a company contract. So, um, yeah, don't, don't try your luck. No, and we forget 40% for inheritance tax is, is incredible as, as an addition to tax you've already paid on those earnings. So, um, I think the key takeaway is that for um, plan for the worst and, and, and plan early. Exactly. Perfect. So, that's a great benefit, the, the protection. and. Of course, we say there's no capital gains tax on, on a pension, brilliant. So uh, if somebody wants to take income, there will be taxation on, on that. So Paul, can you tell us about that? Maybe start with, we're, we're covering the three jurisdictions. Do you yeah. want to start with Gibraltar first, which is the easiest? Well, I've got to know, but I've, I've, okay. I've followed You're ahead of me. But, but yes, um, one of the advantages matters that you pay minimum tax on any pension drawdown. So you're in Spain. If it's structured correctly, something that we will address a bit later, yeah. then the tax that you can pay is probably somewhere between two and six percent, single digits, right? Depending on the amount you draw, how the payment is structured, which is what I will cover later, and the progressive tax rates in the autonomous region in Spain where you live, right? Yeah. So that's why we can't be more specific because those three variables will determine within that two to six percent range how much you pay. But it is minuscule compared with the tax you would pay back home. Of course. So that's uh, in Spain. In Portugal, you pay one and a half percent if you qualify under non-habitual residency for 10 years. If you structure it uh, in the way that we would prescribe, yeah. may I just add that if you don't, then you pay the headline rate of 10. Yeah. So you pay 10 if you if you can't be bothered, if you do it correctly, you pay one and a half. Then post NHR, post NHR, if it's structured correctly, so in year 11, effectively. Again, depending on, on factors, you know, the amount that you draw and how it's structured, 
and their progressive and the progressive tax rates in public, but but you would pay somewhere between 2.1 and 7.2 percent. Um, so that's similar to Spain in the sense of dependent on your income levels. Yeah, yeah, Spain is marginally lower, yeah, but but only fractionally lower. But we're talking two to six in Spain, two to seven in Portugal. And then in Gibraltar, again, it's uh, simple time, and it's just a flat rate of two and a half. Then it is time. very simple. So that's one of the tax benefits. Do you want me to cover all of them? If you can, Paul, that would yeah. be wonderful. Yeah. So the second, I think, advantage of that is that um, uh, I get very excited with QNAPs because what we find is a lot of our um, competitors, you know, they sell a Spanish bond or a Portuguese bond or, or you know, playing vanilla, but, but they don't realize all the advantages of combining bonds with QNAPs. You, you know, you can't be one trick pony. And that's why I'm enthused because generally, for British nationals, it affords so many benefits. The second benefit is there's no capital gains within the structure. So effectively, a pension fund is growing and rolling over free of capital uh, gains tax within the pension arrangement in all three jurisdictions. Which is important because, and we won't go into too much detail, but the NHR in Portugal offers incredible tax benefits but capital gains isn't one of them. 28% if you're in an NHR or not. So that's a huge saving. Correct. And in Spain, it's even more it's not. It's a progressive. Progressive between 19 and 26. Ah, it's it's true. Months, it's yeah. marginally lower, yeah. But, so, but, but still, it peaks at 28. Yeah. So um, as you can see, you know, we talked about tax on, on income. Incredible. No capital gains tax. Incredible advantage. And then, of course, it can be it is removed immediately from the estate, as we talked about, for UK IHD uh, calculation purposes, regardless of where you're tax resident. In other words, you leave the UK, you leave UK shores, you set up the scheme, and ten years later you return. Those assets remain outside the UK estate, even if you return to the UK. So I think that's a, that's what we call Matt, and I would call it. You know, uh, the, the added bonus, the, the cherry on top, is yeah. a rather large cherry on top. Exactly. Say, yeah. yeah. The, the big benefit of, of um, and especially, you know, you, you start working with numbers, right? And say, how can I reduce that UK IHP liability? And how much, based on my age and all the other variables, can I stick into a few months? And suddenly you, you've made a massive savings completely legitimately. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's the third advantage. The fourth one, which I I think um, is 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 an area that, that is sometimes not covered. If you're a beneficiary, so let's assume it's a couple. The husband died, dies, and remember the scheme is in the name of one of them, husband or wife. Mm -hmm. You can't have joint names, this is a pension. So let's assume for 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 um, for, for this discussion that it's a QNAPs in the name of the husband and he's five years older than the wife, he passes away, the wife, the spouse is now the beneficiary and the spouse decides to remain tax resident in the same country as the spouse was, yeah? So in Spain, Portugal, Gibraltar, one of them dies, the other one stays in the same country. Then they can continue to draw a pension income in the same tax efficient manner that was spoken about just a few minutes ago. Yeah? yeah. The two to six, the two to seven, and the two and a half. Absolutely. However, if the spouse wants to collapse the scheme, the pension arrangement, something which we would never recommend, and take it all out as a lump sum, then the tax liability would be massive. This is not the intention of a pension arrangement. Yeah. The idea is it is sheltered and they can continue to draw income tax efficiently, right? Exactly, yeah. And let's, and let's, let's play it out a bit further. The husband dies, the wife becomes the, the first beneficiary in, in uh, inherits. She continues to draw down income and then she in turn nominates the children as beneficiaries. And the children are based in the UK. Then, you know, husband and wife draws income tax efficiently. When the surviving spouse dies, the wife, the children assume the UK tax resident, 
Kangol, thank you very much. Get the hands of the lump sum. No UK inheritance tax, no restrictions. With a UK bond, you know, the state liable at the marginal rate scores. So I think that is an often overlooked massive, massive benefits. No. And then something I don't mention that, but, but I think it would be of interest to all, all those who've, who've taken the trouble to, to, um, to watch the, the webinar. And, and this, please, please, this is not a reason uh, that we recommend for establishing a QLAPS. Um, it's a legitimate pension arrangement, and we, we never promote it on this basis. But because the pension, in the eyes of the law, is quite distinct from a private individual. In other words, it is the pension trustees that are the legal owners of the assets. Yes. Those assets are out of reach of creditors. So let's assume you're in business and, and you've got pension assets and savings and investments, and the pension you know, falls for whatever reason, which anyone in business will know that that's always a risk. You won't have creditors chasing you because those assets are no longer your assets. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's interesting. We never want to promote it in this way, but it has to be mentioned in passing because it's something that maybe people never factor in in their decision making. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's a valid point. Valid point. So, um, we talk about the treatment of, of the income and um, those rates, two to six in Spain, roughly, yeah. two to yeah. seven in Portugal, or one and a half under yeah. NHR. Um, so, how can they obtain those rates? Because you mentioned that uh, uh, it makes sure it's structured correctly. Yes, because basically what it is, Matt, is you can, you can draw a, um, in Spain and Portugal, I mean, the, the concept of annuities in the UK has a totally different meaning. In the UK, if you have a pension scheme and you want to surrender your pension scheme in return for an annuity for life, so they can tell you and say, okay, this is the amount of payments if you die. Yeah. And if you die, in some cases, we'll pay your wife X percent, or maybe not, yeah. as the case may be. You are actually surrendering your, your pension, which means when your spouse passes away as well, there's no residual value for your ultimate beneficiaries, your children, yeah. or, or whatever. Uh, so you're actually giving something for, for, for annuities. When we talk about annuities in Spain and Portugal, it, it, it has a sort of different meaning. What it means here is under Spanish law or, or Portuguese tax law, not in Gibraltar. Um, you can structure your payment as an annuity, so you fix the payment for a period, whether it's, I don't know, two, three, five, 10, 15 years or more. And depending <coughs> on how long you structure the payment for, will determine what the effective tax rate is. And um, with QLAPs, you can do annuities. Sorry, with QROPs, you can do annuities, but it's a bit more complicated. With QROPs, it's very simple. If you funded your QROPs arrangement from assets which have already suffered tax, then you are eligible for, for a Spanish or Portuguese annuity. Yeah. So this is, whereas with the QROPs, it depends whether your employer pay the contributions for you, or, or, or you made the contribution or whether you suffer tax or not. With QNAPs, the assumption is this is savings over, over your lifetime that you've built after paying tax on your income. Yeah. So they qualify for annuities and there's no grains. It is black and white. So you can use the annuity as a vehicle to reduce your taxation. The devil is in the detail. Depends on the amounts that, that you draw down and for the period that you fix it. Yeah. And I think that going into minutia here is not going to add any value to our listeners. Yeah, because it has to be looked at on an individual basis. Okay. But, I, but I think the key is it's, it's an annuity, but not as we know it. It's a temporary annuity, but it's effectively a way of fixing the income. You still got your QNOPs and the yes. block continues to grow, invested, and can be passed on to your beneficiaries, but it's just a very efficient way. Correct. And and those two to six, two to seven percent we, we talk about it is because 
the way Spain and Portugal assess it, only a proportion of that income is taxable. Yeah. And that's effectively times by your tax rate, so yeah. it depends on, on your income levels. And that's how we come to a very attractive income tax rate. Perfect. So um, I think we've, we've covered a lot of the, the tax benefits and, and, and what is a QNOPS. Um, what I think is important to say as well is, is that this um, webinar is about the QNOPS, which is why we're talking about it. But there are other um, investment vehicles out there, the, the compliant bond, and, and I think it's important that we are not tied to one particular vehicle or a product. It's, it's all about the individual circumstances and, and I think you said earlier, Paul, sometimes it's, it's a case of using a combination of the two with which suits the individual better. So that's why we like to have one-to-one -one conversations and, and assess your situation, your needs and, and your existing provisions. Yes, well, what I never, what I can never understand, Matt, is when you engage with a client, potential client, yeah. and they come to see you and you're listening passively to what they have to tell you. And you know that all roads lead to Rome, and Rome is a bond, yeah. Spanish bond or Portuguese bond, and you have it here, and you just want the conversation to end, to come up with a solution. That's not the way we, we engage with, with our clients. Exactly. Uh, you know, they have to tell their story, their personal circumstances, their requirements, their financial goals, and that determines really what the solution is. Of course, yeah. What works for Mr. A is different from Mr. B, but we're not going to put you in this predetermined box Absolutely. where we say you can have that, let's move on to the next exactly. person. So it's important and, and well, it's interesting. We, we come to the final part and, and common pitfalls, and, and I have a few, and I'm sure you do, Paul, and, and they probably cross over a little bit because we, we, we see the same situation. So a, a, a couple from myself is uh, and a lot of this we've covered already, but it's important to reiterate, it has to be a, a, a suitably qualifying QNOPS, that's important, otherwise it's, it's not going to work as, as intended. Um, you also need to ensure the, the underlying assets are a managed professional expert, you know, it, it's, it's got to be managed properly so you can kind of benefit from that. Um, and it's got to be in line with your risk appetite, your range, what you're trying to achieve. That's why, again, you have to have these conversations and, and what we enjoy doing with people. I'm going to say it one more time that the funding needs to be in line with, with your um, requirements. Um, again, that's something that has to be assessed on an individual basis. And, and it's, it's important that you work with somebody that understand how QNOTS works, understand how it's treated in the UK, understand how it's treated in Spain, Portugal, Gibraltar. Um, where, where you are based on now. So, Paul, you have some key advice for us. So, somebody considering the QNOPS, what would you tell them? What, what's key to consider? One piece of advice. One, or if you've got a couple, you know, uh, let you roam for it. Well, that's a, I think the first thing you need to do is you need to engage with someone that you can trust. You know, I see it all the time that people um, Google for answers and they think, and whereas sometimes there's information there which is, if not fully accurate, has an element, you know, it, it can be relied on more often than not. The, the information that is floating online, available online, you know, can range from from fairly accurate to the ridiculous. Yeah, I find some of it just inaccurate, some of it can be a little bit misleading for one of their intentions. And, so, and, yeah. and people Googling and thinking that being smart and clever, I think is a big mistake. Because ultimately, they think they're short in life, whatever you do in life, there's no such thing as shortcuts. Yeah. You know, you want to have a fantastic body, you go to the gym and you pump weights continuously for years, right? Yeah. You, you, you don't take steroids to, to, to try and, and achieve the same results in a shorter period of time. Whatever you do in life, you have to go through, through a process. And I think the most important thing is that you get good quality advice from the, very, from the off. Yeah. And rather than, I'm very clever, I'm going to try X, Y, Z, 
and then find that years later you you see that so often that that they've cornered themselves and they've created a problem that they can't extract themselves off. And then they often knock on the door and say, Can you have me sorted? And very often the answer is no. Yeah, yeah. It's too costly and, and we haven't got the resources. People are trying to do that jigsaw on their own, but unfortunately there's a couple of pieces yeah. missing and you don't understand what the picture is. Exactly. So I always say, you know, make sure you're not you're not penny wise, pound foolish. I'm gonna repeat that. Make sure you're not penny wise, pound foolish. That you think you've you've saved yourself a lot of money, only to find out that you have a massive liability yeah. further down the line. Yeah. I think you know, go to a credible regulated entity that you can trust that is going to give you advice that, that stands the test of time. That is the key, Matt. That stands the test of time. Yeah. And um, and we've been doing QMAP since since um, a change to UK pension legislation. It was the QMAP legislation of 2006 that got tweaked and gave birth to a new concept, which is QMAPs. Yeah. So we, we, we've been successfully structuring these uh, pension assets for a long, for a long time now. Perfect, perfect. And I, I think I'll add one more as well, but it's something we covered is, is the planning is key. The, especially with something like a QMAPs, that we, we don't want people to rush into these things, and that's why it's proper planning with the proper conversations. But the, the earlier you establish your QNOPs, the better the opportunity to, to do that for you. Absolutely. Wonderful. So we reached the end of the webinar. So um, we appreciate those staying with us. We, we have a few um, questions that people have submitted there. So we'll, we'll go through those um very briefly and um, craig has, has told us it's super echoey is it his end i'm not sure quite what we can do at that but thanks maybe, for maybe it's a squeaky voice maybe it's that yeah. accent i don't know um so another question there from jane um as part of a seven steel my husband will get a lump sum at 50 followed by four pension payments from that date does this exclude him well, it says from a queue up there, but I don't know if the question's about a queue up there, there, Jane. I think because of the ambiguity of the question yeah. and, and the reference to queue ups, if Jane could reach out to us or we reach out to Jane, yeah. and then we see clarity at that point because it's not clear. Yeah, I think there are some options there for Jane, but we need to have the whole picture. Yeah. It's the jigsaw again, Jane, where we're missing a few pieces there. So. Feel free to reach out. Um, I mention this now as well because we're not using slides in this webinar. For, for those who want to have a conversation with us, I'm sure you've probably got our details from the registration, but if you don't, our email is inquiries at fwm.gi. You can go to our website, fiduciarewealth.gi, or uh, visit our YouTube channel. Give us a call on, on one of our numbers. We're happy to, to speak to anyone. Um, We've got a couple of questions from an anonymous attendee there, which I didn't see them on the right, which is a bit odd. I think we have a bit of a, um, a stance on those. We're more than happy to answer any question an, an individual has, but if they're hiding behind an anonymous name, um, that kind of... Um, so whoever that is, that may have been accidental that you've hidden your name there and asked these questions. Um, so if you want to reach out to us directly, and, and introduce yourself, we're more than happy to, to answer those. So, um, Craig's there, so um, hopefully he's, he's sorted out the echoey problem. Um, you mentioned compliant bonds briefly. Are these better for an income tax post NHR compared to withdrawing from a QDOPS? So it's a good question, Craig, and, and I don't think today is a place to go into too much detail comparing the, the bonds and, and the QNOS because they, they both have um, both have their advantages and it depends on an individual's circumstances. There are pros and, and cons to both of them and, and depends on the situation. Um, and, and luckily, I think we've already said it, we are not saying you have to have a QNOS, you have to have a bond or, or anything else. It is, Dependent on your individual circumstances. So. And the requirements to withdraw. Remember that the Portuguese bond, you should really not set it up if you intend to draw income 
in the first eight years. Exactly. exactly. Uh, yeah, I don't think they're directly comparable, um, no. um, and they could work alongside each other anyway. Exactly, I, I, I think that's true. So yeah, in answer to Craig, the web issues will have to catch up, not necessarily. I think there's information out there in the World Wide Web. Oh, no, no, I think what Craig is saying is Craig's had issues himself, so he's had ah, to do the webinar I see. and he will catch us at another I time. See. So um, Craig, well, you're, not, you. you're not listening now, you've gone because of your internet, but if you're watching this recording, it'd be, it'd be really nice to talk to you. Jane has come again, so she's clarifying. Let's go back to Jane. It is Q-Nuts. Yeah. You will go up. So, so the one. Oh, sorry, yeah. So, um, husband will get a loan sum at 50, followed by a full pension payments from that date. Does that exclude him from a Q-Nuts? No, it's, it's an unrelated yeah. matter. I mean, Jane, you should look at it, consider q as a vehicle to put some of your savings and investments not already in a pension arrangement yeah for tax purposes yeah exactly so you can have your Europe's or your uk pensions which you leave in the uk or transfer to your Europe's, which is better advice generally but not in every single case and then you can establish a QNAPs alongside your other pension arrangements absolutely so it looks like there, there is a opportunity there for you jane so um Again, we, we said it earlier, we need to assess the whole situation, but I, I think it'd be really worth reaching out to us and, and we're more than happy to have a conversation with you. Um, so Ian has a question. Um, how is a lifetime allowance affected by transferring to a QROPS? Well, um, I mean, this is not the, the this webinar is about QROPS yeah. rather than QROPS. Yeah. But yes, a transfer to a, to a QROPS which is a completely different matter, is when you transfer pension assets. A QROPS is funded from non-UK pension assets. A QROPS is funded from UK pension assets. That is the distinction. But if you were to transfer your, UK, your accrued UK pension benefits to a QROPS for the purposes of everyone else, for, to a QROPS, then it would be deemed a benefit crystallization event subject to the lifetime allowance tests. Absolutely. So but, but, but we don't want to confuse everyone else because we're talking about chalk and cheese, yeah? Exactly. And, and we go back, we've done a few webinars which cover the QOPS in more detail. Where again, you know, we, we can speak to you they about that. Yeah, YouTube channel, yeah? Yeah, please do, yeah. Um, and can I hold an existing frozen defined benefit UK pension into a QNOPS that comes from John? A, a QNOPS isn't funded from a, a, a transfer of. Yeah, we, we are not in that pension. business because yeah. if you look at the spirit of the rules, yeah. you know, it's clear. Yeah. And I know that some providers will do that, but I think like the defined benefit, the steel, British steel defined, you start, you know, this is our table, right? You start, operating outside, you know, on the edges, beyond the edges, right? And then, you know, the scheme gets disqualified and is liable to tax. You know, defined benefit UK pensions should go into a qualified, recognised overseas pension scheme, not into a non-UK pension scheme. Yeah. Because those defined benefit, um, be defined uh, pension benefits, that John is referring to should go into a QROPS, which is a pension arrangement, not into a non-UK. It's it's yeah. It, and a QNOPS, I think you said earlier, Paul, a QNOPS is is funded by assets that have already been taxed. Absolutely. Whereas a defined benefit is, is actually you've had tax relief on that. Correct. Um and, and it's a, a different type of scheme. So defined benefit into a QNOPS, simple terms is is no. Um, and Ian's back, how is a lifetime allowance affected by transfer to Malta, as you described? So I think, again, Ian, it's, it's, not, it's not a webinar for that. You've got a few questions, reach out to us directly, and we can answer that one for sure. Um, and it's interesting questions, just maybe not for, for today. So can, can I ask, uh, ask the, um, the viewers that remain, um, please like, our YouTube um, webinar or go to the YouTube channel, please like, please share, and please subscribe. Uh, because we put a lot of effort 
into um, sharing this knowledge and information. Yeah. And we do it for free. But you know, um, it would be nice if some of you uh, took the time to like, share, and um, yeah, take, take and, and subscribe. Yeah, and become a subscriber. I think we're doing them very regularly. And Matt, if you allow me just one second, we're also starting uh, a podcast, which will be much more open, less structured about topical issues. We will do once a week, and you're allowed to tune in. It doesn't cost you anything, and it'll be an expert finance podcast at least once a week. Yeah. And what a great way to learn and to have a better understanding because we're, we're in the business of, of helping our clients but, but also making sure they understand what they're doing. Absolutely. And, and we've actually seen a few questions today unrelated to the subject, so it shows that there's interest in other subjects. So, um, yeah, we, we've got some webinars we've done already that will be added shortly. So if you subscribe, you'll be able to see those. We'll be doing more webinars in, in the next kind of five to six weeks you'll be able to access those. So um, yeah, if you can do that, we would be um, would be greatly appreciated. Um, we also appreciate the attendance today. It was um, nice to speak to all of you. And um, yeah, we're, we're hoping we'll speak directly with some of you soon. Feel free to reach out. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.